Okay, today is the 24th of July and we are on the Nidana Sangyutta. Nidana is concerned with dependent origination, also specifically uh, dependent origination of suffering. Now we come to the 11th Sutta in the Sangyutta. That's what I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Natapindika Spa. And he said, Monks, there are these four kinds of nutriment for the maintenance of beings that have already come to be and for the assistance of those about to come to be. But for the nutriment, edible food, gross or subtle, second, contact, third, mental volition, fourth, consciousness. These are the four kinds of nutriment for the maintenance of beings that have already come to be and for the assistance of those about to come to be. let stop here for a moment. So, these are four things uh, that act like food uh, to maintain our bodies, uh, uh, to maintain our physical body and our mental body. Uh. So, uh, what are these four things? The first one is edible food. Uh, and uh, edible, edible food we know uh, is necessary for our body. Uh, to, for our body to survive, uh, we need food, uh, physical food. Uh. Then the second is contact. Now, I read to you uh, the footnotes uh, from the commentary. It says, uh, the nutriments are conditions or conditions are called nutriments, ahara, because they nourish or bring forth their own effects. Although there are other conditions for beings, these four alone are called nutriments because they serve as special conditions for the personal life continuity. For edible food, is a special condition for the physical body of those beings who subsist on edible food. In the mental body, contact is a special condition for feeling, mental volition for consciousness, and consciousness for name and form. This one may be a bit hard to understand, so I try to explain. Physical food, edible food, we understand. The second is contact. Contact, once you have contact, then feeling arises, followed by perception, and then thinking, and then volition, uh, deciding what to do. Uh. So, contact uh, is uh, the thing that triggers off the mental workings of the mind. Uh. Uh, so, uh, that's why contact uh, is a uh, nutriment uh, for our mental body. Uh. Now, the third one is mental volition. Mental volition is here, the commentary says, uh, is food for consciousness. But I think another interpretation uh, you can use, uh, this mental volition, uh, the Pali word is mano sanchetana, is, uh, I believe it has something to do with the will to live. Uh, because the will to live uh, is very important uh, for us to survive. Uh for us to continue to survive. If there's no will to live, then a being will die quite fast. So, uh, mental volition. And the fourth is consciousness. Consciousness is more for those beings that are about to come to be. For example, if the male and the female mate, then the egg is fertilized. Now, the egg is fertilized. Uh, it does not have consciousness yet. So, this uh, being uh, that is uh, due to be born in the womb, uh, he will enter uh, enter this fertilized egg. Uh, then that consciousness descends into that fertilized egg. Uh, uh, that is the condition, uh, the nutriment uh, for that being uh, to come into life. Uh. Now, I come back to this uh, contact and mental volition. Uh. This contact... Uh, Without contact, uh, you can see how contact is a, is a food, uh, is a necessary condition. Uh. For example, if a person is imprisoned, you put somebody in a prison uh, and you 
cut him off from contact from other people and you cut him off from contact even with the sunlight put him in a dark room and with nobody to speak to no contact all together very soon now this person will die so that's why contact is, is you can see how contact is a is a nutriment for for the maintenance of a being because once you have contact then you have interest in the world feeling arises there are things in the world that you perceive through your six senses all this is contact the the world is perceived through contact at the six sense doors so because we have interest in the world then we 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 want to survive the will to live is generated on the other hand you consider another prisoner under the same circumstances la he is put in isolation in a room he is cut off from contact uh, from everybody else and even the sunlight light uh, and no sound nothing la uh. and although uh, he should die very soon uh, there are some people uh, who will survive why right? because uh, that person uh, may be thinking of his family think of his children his wife uh, so when he thinks ah uh, this of course comes from his memory lah uh, doesn't come from contact comes from his memory ah uh, so when this uh, memory uh, of the family is generated uh, the will to live is very strong uh, so th- because of the will to live uh, even though he should die uh, he will hold on to life lah uh, ah so this i believe uh, is the is this the third uh, nutriment mentioned here lah uh, mental volition uh, is the will to live lah uh, and then consciousness uh, must come into the womb uh, for that being uh, to come to life uh. so you can see here uh, why uh, these uh, four are called uh, nutriments uh. and the buddha continue monks these four kinds of nutriment have what as their source what as their origin from what are they born and produced these four kinds of nutriment have craving as their source craving as their origin they are born and produced from craving i stop here for a moment what craving is this this craving is craving for existence and craving for sensual pleasures because of this craving so we want to continue with life and the buddha continues and this craving has what as its source what as its origin from what is it born and produced this craving has feeling as its source feeling as its origin it is born and produced from feeling stop it for a moment na most specifically ya yeah, this is a uh, feeling uh, we have a pleasant feeling and pleasant feeling and neutral feeling lah it is the pleasant feeling we experience ah uh, that gives rise to craving lah to continue and this feeling has what as its source feeling has contact as its source and this contact has what as its source contact has the six sense bases as its source and these sense six and these six sense bases have what as their source the six sense bases have mentality materiality phenomena as their source and this mentality materiality has what as its source there's consciousness as its source and consciousness has volition as its source and volition has ignorance uh, uh, as its source la thus monks with ignorance as condition volition comes to be with volition as condition Uh, consciousness etc etc such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering but with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance comes cessation of volition with the cessation of volition cessation of consciousness etc etc such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering uh, so here so this this sutta is about the four nutriments uh, how uh they feed our physical body and our mental body and uh, how they are necessary for beings to continue mm. the next sutta is 12.12 at savati the buddha said monks there are these four kinds of nutriment for the maintenance of beings that have already come to be and for the assistance of those about to come to be what for the nutriment edible food grows or subtle 
second contact, third mental volition, fourth consciousness. These are the four kinds of nutriment for the maintenance of beings that have already come to be and for the assistance of those about to come to be. When this was said, the Venerable Molia Paguna said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, who consumes the, the nutriment consciousness? Because he taught nah, consciousness is a nutriment, who consumes it? Nah? And the Buddha said, not a valid question. I do not say one consumes. If I should say one consumes, in that case, this would be a valid question. Venerable Sir, who consumes? But I do not speak thus. Since I do not speak thus, if one should ask me, Venerable Sir, for what is the nutriment consciousness a condition? This would be a valid question. To this, the valid answer is, the nutriment consciousness is a condition for the production of future renewed existence. When that which has come into being exists, the six sense bases come to be. With the six sense bases as condition, contact. Let's stop here for a moment. So here, you see, eh? consciousness is a condition for the production of future renewed being or existence. Eh? So just like I mentioned just now, eh? the uh, egg in the womb is fertilized. Eh? Then new, uh, consciousness must come in eh? into that fertilized egg. Eh? And then it produces eh? renewed existence. Eh? Uh, that being produces itself in that uh, uh, fertilized egg. Eh? Mm. And then once that consciousness has come into that egg, eh, then slowly eh, the six sense bases eh, uh, are produced. Eh. Mm. Now, if we, we think about it, eh, this is not the only case eh, of consciousness eh, producing eh, renewed existence. Eh, because eh, consciousness eh, in the Buddha's teaching eh, is not a constant flow, you know. It's not a constant flow. Consciousness in the Buddha's teaching uh, is momentary. Consciousness arises and passes away. Arises and passes away. Arises and passes away. Right? Uh, so, whenever consciousness arises, uh, that, that being comes into existence. Lah, right? And that being is alive lah, when consciousness arises. And then when consciousness ceases, uh, momentarily uh, that being dies. Uh, and then when consciousness arises again, uh, that being has come into life and then it dies. But because this consciousness arises and passes away so fast uh, that it would seem as though uh, this is a continued consciousness, uh, a stream of continued consciousness. Uh, uh, but it is not so. Uh. Now, if we think carefully about it, uh, every time this consciousness arises and passes away, uh, why does it arise again? Why does it arise again? I think uh, it is the will to live. Uh, because of the will to live, uh, the moment consciousness uh, dies out, uh, uh, it has come into life again because of the will to live. That's why you see the chain of dependent origination. Uh, avijja, pachaya, sankara, Ignorance, conditions, volition. And volition, conditions, consciousness. Right? Mm -hmm. So this volition uh, is the will to live. Uh, the will to live uh, conditions consciousness to spring into life. Mm -hmm. And then it dies out in a short moment. And then because of the will to live, uh, it arises again. Uh, so dependent origination uh, can be considered like the traditional interpretation three lives or two lives, uh, but it can be considered right here and now, uh, in this very life, uh, moment to moment, uh, you have you, you can consider in that way. Uh. And then this verbal Mulya Paguna asks, Verbal Sir, who makes contact? And the Buddha said, not a valid question. I do not say one makes contact. If I should say one makes contact, in that case, this would be a valid question. Venerable Sir, who makes contact? But I do not speak thus. Since I do not speak thus, if one should ask me, Venerable Sir, with what as condition does contact come to be? This would be a valid question. To this, the valid answer is, with the sixth sense basis as condition, contact comes to be. With contact as condition, feeling. 
and stop here for a moment. Huh? So here you see, huh? contact huh? means contact at the six sense doors. Huh? So in order that you can, that contact can arise, huh? of course you must have the six sense doors. Huh? That means you must have the six sense bases. Huh? And once there is contact at the six sense bases, huh? then uh, feeling arises. Huh? Terrible sir, who feels? Not a valid question, the Blessed One replied. I do not say one feels. If I should say one feels, in that case, this would be a valid question. Terrible sir, who feels? But I do not speak thus. Since I do not speak thus, if one should ask me, Terrible sir, with what as condition does feeling come to be? This would be a valid question. To this, the valid answer is, with contact as condition, feeling comes to be. With feeling as condition, craving. So we uh, stop here for a moment. Huh? So, uh, as we mentioned before, huh? if you have pleasurable feeling, huh? then craving arises. Huh? Sir, who craves? Not a valid question, the Blessed One replied. I do not say one craves. If I should say one craves, in that case, this would be a valid question. Venerable Sir, who craves? But I do not speak thus. Since I do not speak thus, if one should ask me, Venerable Sir, with what as condition does craving come to be? This would be a valid question. To this, the valid answer is, with feeling as condition, craving comes to be. With craving as condition, clinging. With clinging as condition, existence or being, etc., etc. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. But Paguna, with the remainderless fading away and cessation of the six sense of the six bases for contact, comes cessation of contact. With the cessation of contact, cessation of feeling. With the cessation of feeling, cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving, cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging, cessation of being. With the cessation of being, cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Uh, that's the end of the sutta. So here, this sutta, uh, the Buddha says, uh, there is no being. Uh, uh, this is what the Buddha implies. Uh, so because of that, uh, you cannot say who consumes, uh, or who feels, uh, or who makes contact, uh, etc. Uh, so uh, it's just that these uh, conditions uh, just arise naturally. Uh, mm. It's just the, the perception of a being uh, is just a perception in our mind. Uh. Now we come to the 15 sutta in this Nidana, Nidana Sangyutta at Savati. Then the venerable Kachana Gota approached the Blessed One paid homage to him, sat down to one side and said to him, Venerable Sir, it is said, right view, right view. In what way, Venerable Sir, is there right view? And the Buddha said, This world, Kachana, for the most part, depends upon the duality, upon the notion of existence and the notion of non-existence. Let's stop here for a moment. This in India at that time, most people... Uh, either believe in the idea of existence uh, or the idea of non-existence. This all this is another word for it. Uh, is a notion of existence. Uh, that means perpetual existence. Uh, that means uh, eternalism view. Uh, that means when you die, uh, you will continue to exist. Uh, uh, and it's the same person who dies uh, and is reborn. Uh, that is uh, one extreme view. Uh. The other extreme view is non-existence. Uh. It's the annihilationist view. Uh, that once a person dies, uh, there is no more uh, rebirth. Uh, there is no more existence. Uh. So these two views, uh, all, uh, the Buddha does not accept uh, because it assumes uh, or presumes uh, the, that a self exists. Uh, that a self exists. So they argue whether after death... Uh, that self continues to exist or the self does not continue to exist. But in the Buddhist teaching, this self is just a concept in our mind that nature has planted in our mind to make us strive to fight for survival. And then the Buddha continued. But for one who sees the origin of the world as it really is with correct wisdom, there is no notion of non-existence in regard to the world. And for one who sees the cessation of the world as it really is with correct wisdom, 
there is no notion of existence in regard to the world. This world, kachana, is for the most part shackled by engagement, clinging and adherence. But this one with right view does not become engaged and cling through that engagement. And clinging, stand, mental standpoint, adherence, underlying tendency. He does not take a stand about myself. He has no perplexity or doubt that what arises is only suffering arising. What ceases is only suffering season, ceasing. His knowledge about this is independent of others. It is in this way, Kachana, that there is right view. All exists, Kachana, this is one extreme. All does not exist, this is the second extreme. Without veering towards either of these extremes, the Tathagata teaches the Dhamma by the middle. With ignorance as condition, volition comes to be. With volition as condition, consciousness etc., etc. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. But with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance comes cessation of volition. With the cessation of volition, cessation of consciousness, etc., etc. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. So the Buddha says uh, that uh, the Buddha's way of seeing uh, is not whether a self exists after death or not, uh, but Everything is due to conditions. This world, everything in this world is conditionally arisen, dependently arisen, dependent on conditions. 12.16 at Savati. Then a certain monk approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and said, Remember, sir, it is said, a speaker on the Dhamma, a speaker on the Dhamma. In what way, venerable sir, is one a speaker on the Dhamma? Monk, if one teaches the Dhamma for the purpose of revulsion towards aging and death, or its fading away and cessation, one is fit to be called a monk who is a speaker on the Dhamma. If one is practicing for the purpose of revulsion towards aging and death, or its fading away and cessation, one is fit to be called a monk who is practicing in accordance with the Dhamma. If through revulsion towards aging and death, through its fading away and cessation, one is liberated by non-clinging, one is fit to be called a monk who has attained Nibbana in this very life. Monk, if one teaches the Dhamma for the purpose of revulsion towards birth, for the purpose of revulsion towards ignorance, for its fading away and cessation, one is fit to be called a monk who is a speaker on the Dhamma. If one is practicing for the purpose of revulsion towards ignorance, for its fading away and cessation, one is fit to be called a monk who is practicing in accordance with the Dhamma. If through revulsion towards ignorance, to its fading away and cessation, one is liberated by non-clinging, one is fit to be called a monk who has attained Nibbana in this very life. Uh, it's the end of the sutta. So here the Buddha is saying, uh, the speaker of the Dhamma should be one uh, who teaches uh, with the purpose uh, of revulsion towards aging and death. Uh, to make people see uh, that we uh, should, should have revulsion towards uh, birth, aging and death. 12.17 Just have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel sanctuary. Then in the morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking bowl and robe, entered Rajagaha for arms. The naked ascetic saw the Blessed One coming in the distance. Having seen him, he approached the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When they had concluded their greetings and cordial talk, he stood to one side and said to him, We would like to ask Master Gautama about a certain point, if he would grant us the favor of answering our question. Let's stop here for a moment. You see, the Buddha was going on arms round. And as the Buddha was going on arms round, this naked ascetic came and wanted to ask a question. So the Buddha said, This is not the right time for a question, Kasapa. We have entered among the houses. A second time and a third time, the naked ascetic said to the Blessed One, We would like to ask Master Gautama about a certain point, if he would grant us the favor of answering our question. This is not the right time for a question, Kasapa. We have entered among the houses. 
Then the naked ascetic Kasapa said to the Blessed One, We do not wish to ask Master Gautama much. Then the Buddha said, Then ask what you want, Kasapa. How is it, Master Gautama? Is suffering created by oneself? Not so, Kasapa, the Blessed One said. Then, Master Gautama, is suffering created by another? Not so, Kasapa, the Blessed One said. How is it then, Master Gautama, is suffering created both by oneself and by another? Not so, Kasapa, the Blessed One said. Then, Master Gautama, has suffering arisen fortuitously, being created neither by oneself nor by another? Not so, Kasapa, the Blessed One said. How is it then, Master Gautama? Is there no suffering? It is not that there is no suffering, Kasapa. There is suffering. Then is it that Master Gautama does not know and see suffering? It is not that I do not know and see suffering, Kasapa. I know suffering. I see suffering. Let's stop here for a moment. Uh. So you see this, this naked ascetic. Uh, he say he's not going to ask much, but he's asking a lot. Uh. And finally he said, whether you are asked, how is it, Master Gautama, is suffering created by oneself or is it created by another or is it created by both or is it created by neither? In each case you say, not so, Kasapa. When you are asked, how is it then, Master Gautama, isn't it? Is there no suffering? You say, it is not that there is no suffering, Kasapa, there is suffering. When asked, then is it that Master Gautama does not know and see suffering? You say, it is not that I do not know and see suffering, Kasapa. I know suffering, I see suffering. Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One explain suffering to me. Let the Blessed One teach me about suffering. And the Buddha said, Kasapa, if one thinks, the one who acts is the same as the one who experiences the result, then one asserts with reference to one existing from the beginning. Suffering is created by oneself. When one asserts thus, this amounts to eternalism. A kasapa, if one thinks the one who acts is one, the one who experiences the result is another, then one asserts with reference to one stricken by feeling, suffering is created by another. When one asserts thus, this amounts to annihilationism. Without veering towards either of these extremes, the Tathagata teaches the Dhamma by the middle, where ignorance has condition. Volition comes to be, with volition as condition, consciousness, etc., etc. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. But with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance, comes cessation of volition. With the cessation of volition, cessation of consciousness, etc. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. When this was said, the naked ascetic Kasapa said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Venerable Sir, Magnificent Venerable Sir, the Dhamma has been made clear in many ways by the Blessed One, as though he were turning upright, but had been turned upside down, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go for refuge to the Blessed One, and to the Dhamma, and to the Bhikkhu Sangha. May I receive the going forth under the Blessed One. May I receive the higher ordination. Stop here for a moment see this 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 uh, kasapa he, he, after the buddha replied na uh, he seemed to have understood immediately na uh, so he was so impressed uh, that he wanted to be ordained uh, under the buddha you notice here uh, normally in the suttas uh, when they go for refuge uh, they go for refuge to the buddha to the dhamma and the bhikkhu sangha hmm? normally uh, we take refuge uh, in the Bhikkhu Sangha, the Mang Sangha. And then the Buddha said, Kasapa, one formerly belonging to another sect who desires the going forth and the higher ordination in this Dhamma Vinaya lives on probation for four months. At the end of the four months, if the monks are satisfied with him, they may, if they wish, give him the going forth and the higher ordination to the state of a monk. But individual differences are recognized by me. And he said, If, Venerable Sir, one formerly belonging to another sect who desires the going forth and the higher ordination in this Dhamma Vinaya lives on probation for four months, and if at the end of the four months 
the monks being satisfied with him may if they wish him give him the going forth and the higher ordination to the state of a monk then i will live on probation for four years at the end of the four years if the monks are satisfied with me let them if they wish give me the going forth and the higher ordination to the state of a monk then the naked ascetic kasapa received the going forth under the blessed one and he received the higher ordination Let's stop here for a moment now. So because this person was so sincere, uh, he said, nah, if normally people have to wait four months to be ordained, nah, I'm willing to wait four years. Lah. So the Buddha saw that he was so earnest, so sincere, the Buddha immediately ordained him. And soon, not long after his higher ordination, dwelling alone, withdrawn, diligent, ardent and resolute, the Venerable Kasapa, by realizing it for himself with direct knowledge in this very life, entered and dwelt in that unsurpassed goal of the holy life, for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the household life into homelessness. He directly knew, destroying his birth, the holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more for this state of being. And the Venerable Kasapa became one of the Arahans. It's the end of the Sutta. So here he was asking uh, whether suffering is created by oneself or created by the by another person, another being. Uh, and basically the Buddha wanted to tell him uh, that suffering is not created by anybody, uh, but created by conditions. Uh, so I explained dependent origination to him uh, and then he understood uh, and decided to renounce.